I'm Felicity Muth from the University of Nevada in Reno, and I'm going to be talking about a protocol for measuring bee cognition in the wild that we recently published in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. In this video, I'm going to mention some findings from our paper, but also give some tutorial style suggestions to help researchers and students carry out this method themselves. Wild bees could offer a useful system for us to study cognitive ecology and comparative cognition. They encompass around 20,000 species globally, and they vary in characteristics such as their life history strategy, their degree of sociality, and their dietary specialization. And even just within the genus Bombus, the bumblebee, encompassing over 250 species, there is a lot of variation in environmental traits that could affect cognition, such as climatic factors affecting floral diversity and availability. And we know that bees like honeybees and bumblebees rely heavily on learning and memory to learn about the wide variety of flowers that they visit. However, cognitive traits can be problematic to study in wild animals. This means most of what we know about cognition comes from lab studies with lab-reared animals. And while these controlled studies are required to accurately measure aspects of cognition, they may not yield realistic estimates of learning performance in natural environments. For example, cognition in bees is most often addressed either where the bees are completely harnessed or where they are completely free-moving. But there is evidence that how harnessed bees behave might not be representative of how free-moving bees behave. In contrast, free-moving protocols where bees visit artificial flowers, like the ones that you see here, are not tractable for wild bees. They often require extensive pre-training to a floral array and it can be difficult to keep social bees motivated for long periods while they're away from their colony. And in free-moving assays, the individual bee controls which flowers she visits, when she visits them, if she visits them at all, which can sometimes make it difficult to compare learning between different groups. So we came up with a protocol which falls between these two extremes. A bee is contained, but free to walk around, and we control the order and timing of stimulus and reward presentation. And one of the nice things about this protocol is you can train and test multiple individuals at once, which means you can get larger sample sizes for your study. I'm going to talk about three of the main ways that we use this protocol to look at learning in bees. But it's worth noting that any of these protocols can be adjusted in terms of what rewards or punishment you use, how many trials you do, how long you spend between each trial in order to address the question that you want to ask. So the first way that we tested bees was using a protocol that we called the single choice protocol. In the single choice protocol, the researcher completely controls what the bee experiences and the bee doesn't make a choice throughout the learning trials. For absolute conditioning, the bee is given a single color with a sucrose reward. Each bee is given a presentation or a trial like this every five minutes. And because each trial for each bee takes only about 10 or 20 seconds, it meant that we could carry out trials for about 10 bees at the same time. So here is a bee on her second trial, and after three more trials, so a total of five trials, we gave bees a test trial. So the important thing about this test or probe trial is that neither of the stimuli have any rewards on them. In this case, the bee goes to the blue strip and extends her proboscis, so we would count this as a choice for the blue, which was the colour she was trained was rewarding, so it's a correct choice. Although you do see that when she finds that there's only water in the blue strip, she does pretty rapidly move over and sample the yellow strip as well. In contrast to absolute conditioning, where an animal is given a stimulus and a reward, Animals can also be trained via differential conditioning, where they're given both a stimulus and a reward, but also a different stimulus paired with either a punishment or lack of reward. When we train bees using differential conditioning in the single choice protocol, we first presented bees with a rewarding stimulus, in this case the blue strip with sucrose on it, and after they had extended their proboscis to it for three seconds, we removed it and immediately gave them the unrewarding yellow strip, which contains only water. It's worth noting that on the later trials, like the one that you see here, the bee might only sample the unrewarding stimulus very briefly or not at all.
Using lab-rated Bombus and Patients bumblebees, we carried out preference tests, where we gave bees a choice between the two colours, and then we trained them in the way just shown, either by absolute or by differential conditioning. And we found that bees learnt the associations with the colours they were trained to in the way that you would expect. However, the degree to which bees learnt, as shown by their test performance, didn't differ between the absolute and the differential training conditions, which isn't what we'd expect. We'd expect the bees that were trained via differential conditioning to learn better. We also wanted to know if this protocol would work with wild-caught bees, so we caught some Apis mellifera honeybees, brought them into lab, and trained and tested them in the tubes using the single-choice protocol. Here's a honeybee being presented with a rewarding blue strip of paper in the absolute conditioning protocol. But it's worth noting that in all these cases, half the bees were trained where one colour was rewarding and half were trained where the other colour was rewarding. And here's a honeybee being tested using the differential conditioning procedure. So here a bee is presented with a rewarding blue strip and then a yellow strip containing water. And you can see here that, especially early on in trials, wild bees would drink the water as well as the sucrose. As with the lab-reared Bombus and Patience bumblebees, we also found that the wild-caught Apis mellifera honeybees did learn, but again, we didn't see strong differences between the groups in the direction that would be predicted by learning theory. So, bees learnt just as well when they were trained via absolute as compared to differential conditioning, and there was no difference when we used a more aversive stimulus, salt, compared to water. So, we then went on to come up with a procedure where we could get multiple measures for each individual. We called this the multi-choice protocol because in each trial, the bee is given a choice between the two stimuli. And on every trial, the bee still experiences both of them, but the bee is the one that decides which order it is that it will sample them. For this protocol, we gave each bee seven trials. So in each trial, the bee could make a choice followed by an unrewarded test phase as before. And this meant that we just got a lot more data per individual and that we could look at group level learning performance. So in this case, the bee goes to the rewarding color, the blue. It gets to drink for three seconds. The blue is then removed. And then it's given the chance to drink from the yellow strip for three seconds. In this case, the bee chooses the incorrect strip. She goes to the yellow one and she extends her proboscis before moving over to the blue strip. Again, often on later trials, once the bee has learnt the association, she won't even sample the unrewarding strip. And as before, in the test phase, we present the bee with the two strips, both only with water on them, and we record the strip that the bee extends her proboscis to first as her choice. When we used this multi-choice protocol on lab-reared bombers and patients, we found that it did yield enough data in order to see differences that you'd expect based on learning theory predictions. So for example, the bees that were trained with a more aversive, unconditioned stimulus learnt a lot faster than bees that were trained with just water. And similarly, there was a strong trend for bees that were trained to a more difficult discrimination to learn slower than bees that were trained to an easier discrimination. So even though the single choice protocol does clearly demonstrate learning, we would recommend that if you want to detect fine scale differences between groups, you carry out this multi-choice protocol. As a side note, in the protocols that we talk about here, all of these are for generating group level differences. But we've now used this protocol in lab to get many more measures for each individual bee. So for example, instead of giving a bee seven choices, you give her 70 choices. And this is not as good in that you can only test one bee at a time, but it does mean that you can look at individual learning curves as well as group level learning curves. And we used both this multi-choice protocol and the single-choice protocol on wild Bombus vosnesenskii that were caught in the field and tested on site before being released. So here you can see a wild bee going to the yellow stimulus before going to the rewarding blue stimulus. And here a different bee goes to the rewarding yellow strip before going to the unrewarding blue strip.
And we found that both the single choice and the multi choice protocol worked in terms of wild bees actually learning in field settings. And even though in this study we only report results from wild caught Bombus vosnesenskii, we tried this on a handful of different Bombus species, both females and males, and we found that it seemed to work in all the cases that we tried. So finally, I'm just going to give a few tricks and tips to help people use this protocol because we're hoping that this protocol will be used by researchers who haven't necessarily worked on learning and cognition in the past but might want to ask a question relating to learning in the system that they work in. We found that this protocol is great for undergraduates to carry out. We've done larger scale teaching laboratories where we've had a number of students carrying out learning trials with bees in order for them to learn about learning and memory and cognitive experiments. But even though it's a very simple protocol, there are still some things to be wary of to make sure that you do it correctly. For the multi-choice protocol, on each trial and in all the other protocols for the test trial, the bee has to make a choice between the two strips of paper. And so in order to really clearly see this choice, both strips of paper need to be in the tube, spatially separated, and you need to be able to see the bee walking towards the two strips such that she can also see both strips at once. So if the bee is sitting down the end of the tube, sticking both strips in doesn't really work because it's very hard to see what kind of choice the bee might be making. Having holes cut in either end of the tube is quite handy because it means that if a bee is sitting down one end of the tube and you want to test it from the other, you can easily flip the tube over and put the strips in on the other side. Sometimes bees can sit at one end of the tube for a long time, either biting at the corners, trying to get out, or just sitting there. And one trick to encourage them to move along the tube is to slightly tilt the tube upwards. Early on in training, in particular before the first trial, sometimes bees will just stay in one place and it can be hard to get them going. In these cases, it can help to stick the strip through another hole in the tube and stimulate the bee's antennae. I normally only do this on the very first trial because after this, the bees will be running around and it's easy to test them in the same way as all the other bees at the end of the tube. Similarly, bees are often quite aggressive early on in training, especially in lab reared bees. And in these cases, the best way to stop them being aggressive is to put the rewarding stimulus on their antennae. Bumblebees can taste through their antennae, so if you gently touch their antennae with the sucrose, their proboscis comes out, they start to drink, and generally they become less aggressive after this point. Okay, so finally, some things not to do. Don't stick the strip of paper in and poke the bee. This will generally mean that the bee gets quite aggressive, and in this case, it seemed to drink nonetheless, but in lots of cases, the bee might just stop wanting to behave after this point. And lastly, when you're working closely with these bees in the tubes, be careful not to breathe out on them. Bees can detect carbon dioxide in your breath, and it makes them behave very aggressively. And after this, they'll be unlikely to want to partake in the experiment at all. To see more about this method for looking at learning in wild bees, please go and check out our paper in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. Thank you.